Would you like to be somebody who understands why Frodo from the Lord of the Rings represents the Son from the Holy Spirit, the Christian concept? Then listen to this entire video where I explain how Frodo, the Son, is the embodiment of the hero who saves the Father, the kingdom, the, the culture, the tradition from the dragon, from the, the, the enemy, the outside enemy, in this case, Sauron. So before we get into this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to learn more about self-development, dating, Jungian psychology, and how to reduce suffering in life. Let's get into it. All right, so in my previous video, I discussed how Aragorn represented the father of the Holy Trinity. So in The Lord of the Rings, Aragorn represents the father, Frodo the son, and Gandalf the Holy Spirit, which I will talk about tomorrow. But now let's talk about the son, Frodo. So the sun is basically the physical manifestation of the divine within the individual human. You could equate it with consciousness, actually, which I'll get to in a bit. So Frodo represents the heroic divine principles acted out by the singular, like the, the literal single human, or this, in this case, hobbit. It is, it is the, the, the example, the literal physical example of a human acting out these, these, these religious principles or these mythological principles. So whilst the father creates order and protects the realm with tradition, norms, culture, so people can live in harmony and peace without, you know, destroying each other so that they're able to trust each other, Frodo saves the father because the father becomes blind because whilst the, the father is you're protecting the, the, the realm from the enemy, it was successful in the past, but the enemy on the outside, basically the environment that threatens the status quo, is shifting and adapting and growing stronger. It, it's, it's, its weapons are adapting and transforming. So the father would need to adapt itself, but the father is stagnant. It, it becomes proud hubristic maybe even, and therefore the, the son needs to save and up, update the culture, update the father by going into the, uh, going into the unknown and fighting the, 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 the enemy himself, the son, and then coming back and sort of, uh, let's say, while well, saving the father essentially. So the son Frodo undertakes the literal saving and confronts the threat directly because he locates the heart of the problem. So let's break it down a little bit. The son ventures out into the unknown to confront the problem, the dragon. And in this case, it is Sauron. And in Return of the King, the last movie of Lord of the Rings, Frodo actually, with Sam, ventures into the heart of the enemy, which is this the, the volcano, I'm not sure the name, but the volcano where the ring was, how do you say, forged in the beginning. So he literally, what, what he does is, he locates the source of the problem. And that can be, if we sort of try and compare that to normal day-to-day -day life, in a society, you know, there are problems boiling societal inequality maybe, or other environmental problems. And to fix a problem, you need to first locate the problem and analyze what the traits of the problem are before you can solve it. You need to like face it eye to eye, directly look at it. And this is what Frodo does. He literally ventures into the core of the problem whilst the father, Aragorn, does not. Nobody else does it, but the son does it. And the son does it with consciousness by questioning and is being critical of, of and curious, actually, of, let's say, the shortcomings of the father and what the problem is. Yes. So let's talk a little bit of the, about the characteristics of the sun. Now, the sun is also the hero in some sense. It's like the hero archetype. So the sun is humble, or let's say the hero is humble. 
visually overlooked. And what I mean by that is the son or the hero does not actually appear to be, does not look like what you typically think a hero would look like. For, for example, the, the real son in real life, in our world, the, the hero does not look like a hero from the Avengers with a cape and, you know, super buff. It is not, like the Hobbit is a small, you know, halfling who does not look like a protector, let's say. The hero just wants to live in peace, actually, and, and in quiet, and calmness. And that's also kind of like what Sam is. Sam is also kind of like a hero because he goes with Frodo into the unknown and Sam actually, you know, just wants to, you know, just before they're about like on the verge of dying, Sam talks about how he wishes, you know, if he were to marry somebody, he would marry this, this other hobbit uh, w woman. And he, 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 he dreams of the shire, of the peace, you know, of, 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 just living in peace, really. He does not want fame, he does not want power, he does not want wealth, he just wants his peace, really. And that is super important. The hero is, the true, true hero is not a human who wants power, fame or money, because they are corruptible, and that is why the king is not the hero, because the king is prone to being corrupted. The king is, has the potential to become proud and arrogant, and therefore is corruptible. And that is also why it becomes corrupted as time prolongs, because it becomes, it becomes stagnant and arrogant and falls for fame and money and power. And that's why the son needs to come and redeem the father again and save the father. But the son does not want that. And that's why the son is qualified and eligible to go out and save to do the literal undertaking of, of, of saving the father, of saving the civilization. Yes. So, let's talk about a few other key points here. At the darkest moment, the hero emerges. Frodo and Sam save, you know, they throw the ring, or the, the ring is tossed into the, the lava of the volcano, and that occurs at a point where almost all hope is lost. You know, Aragorn and his army are completely surrounded and outnumbered by Sauron's army. You know, they're in front of the, the I forgot what they're called, like the, the Black Gates or something. You know, Aragorn, Ara, Aragorn's army is, you know, in a circle and Sauron's army is just engulfing it, you know, completely outnumbered. And there you, th you immediately see like, you know, all hope is lost. And... Frodo and Sam have lost all energy. They are at the brink of collapsing. They have no energy left. They're at the footstep of the volcano where it is darkest, where there is no light or seemingly no light, just, just evil surrounding them. Just darkness is completely engulfing the light. And then that is where the hero emerges and the world is saved. So it's when hope is almost, almost vanishes, the good wins and is resurrected. And this is, you can kind of equate this also to uh, Jesus's, the concept of Jesus's birthday, because Jesus's birthday is on the 24th of December. And that is also very close to the darkest point of, of the year, you know, where the dark, where you have the, uh, the fewest number of hours of light. You know, I think it's the 22nd of December is the, when, you know, the sun goes down the earliest and you basically have the longest night. So that is when the hero, Jesus, the son, emerges. You know, Jesus is the son of the Holy Trinity. The Father, God, the Son, Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit. So that's super interesting. I haven't quite figured out why this, this archetypal process exists, why the sun emerges at the darkest point in time, because it is a very frequent concept and process. Like, a lot of people say, say, you know, they had their, their low point in life and after that they transformed and they reached success. They, you know, they found the meaning of life. Like you need to first, oh. And Carl Jung also says, before you can ascend to the heights in life, you first need to descend into the darkness. And that's also comparable to shadow integration. 
the shadow archetype, integrating that into your, into your consciousness. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, I'm starting to see similarities here now. But it's definitely a common theme, but I haven't quite figured out why that psychologically occurs. Anyway, I'll, I'll make another video. I'll, I'll take some time to think about that. Yes. So the sun also represents consciousness. And the reason why is because the sun consciously questions everything, why things work the certain ways. And then the father comes in and teaches the sun how to protect and create order out of chaos, which the sun then embodies and learns and then goes out to do himself. Yet the father also teaches some tyrannical elements that are oppressive to a degree and have become obsolete, I would say. And then the, the, the son says, okay, this is insufficient. This is, this is not palatable. We need to change this because the environment has changed, society has changed, and these tyrannical elements are outdated. They're, no, long, they're no, no longer sufficient. So then the son updates the father's system. He embodies the, let's say, the, the valuable wisdom and then with help of the Holy Spirit, which guides the sun, the sun then goes out into the unknown, learns and comes back and updates the father, basically saves the father from the dragon. You know, the, the dragon was about to eat the father and the sun goes out to confront the dragon, kills the dragon and saves the father, basically. So he updates the father, the structure, the tradition, the system, the culture. Yep. Yeah. And the, 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 it's almost like the Holy Spirit guides the Son in doing that by, you know, guiding the Son towards what is righteous and what is good, I would say. Yes. And is that, it's that sort of connection to the divine through consciousness, maybe. So Frodo is the ideal son who saves the world, who goes on. This is super important because Frodo really embodies that ideal. And at the end of Return of the King, Frodo leaves the Shire and his friends behind to go on with Bilbo Baggins and Gandalf on a new adventure. And this is super interesting because th it was kind of heartbreaking. You thought they had built this, this, this bond with Sam, this, this deep meaning of for friendship with Sam and Merry and Pippin, you know, the three hobbits, the three friends or the four friends with Frodo. But then in the end, Frodo leaves. And that's because the process of saving the world never ends. And Frodo is that embodiment of the sun, and the sun is always needed. It is always needs to save the father, kind of. And whilst Sam, Merry, and Pippin helped, they were kind of the embodiment, they were still just, let's say, the, the, the co-heroes of the story who just wanted the peace to live in peace and quiet. And then Jesus, uh, sorry, yeah, Jesus or Frodo is the ringleader, the embodiment, the apex of the hero and who guides the whole movement, the whole process. But because he cannot, he is the ideal. He does not rest. The sun never rests. The sun never settles. The sun is always needed in a new adventure. Hence, he leaves and must be, he, he is summoned somewhere else where the world needs saving, which is super awesome, I think. So there is a sacrificial element, like once he sac Frodo sacrifices himself and saves the world, he must move on because his duty is done. And that's kind of what Jesus did. He came to redeem humanity from, from its sins, from its downfall, but then left because his work, his duty was done in some sense. Anyway, so in conclusion, Frodo embodies the son because the son is the actor. It is the action of saving the father from the dragon, from, from the monster, from the environment that has shifted, grown and adapted and is about to implode and collapse on the, on the father and, and destroy the father. So Frodo goes out, confronts the evil, so Sauron, the, the threat, directly at its core. So he is, with his consciousness, he questions what the father is doing wrong. What is, like, he, he, he questions the problem that is threatening the system. He, like, directly, he goes into the core of the problem, which you need to do before, like, in order to, to really fix any kind of problem, you need to analyze it 
at its core. And he almost dies so that, you know, good, good, the, the good succeeds when almost all hope is lost. There is sort of this death and rebirth process also, which is present, by the way, within the Father and within the Holy Spirit and the Son. So, and then, you know, Frodo is, is the embodiment of this, this, this sacrificing hero, which is present across all kinds of mythology. The hero sacrifices himself and almost dies, but is then rewarded afterwards and saves the father. He ventures into the unknown and saves the father. Is there anything else? Yes. So please leave a comment below whether you think there are any other arguments for why Frodo represents the, fa the, the son of the Holy Trinity or why actually he does not represent the son. Do you think somebody else represents the son or the whole concept is, is just garbage? So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to learn more about self-development, dating, Jungian psychology, and how to reduce suffering in life. Thank you for listening.